get to hear what you have to say. Okay, thank you. Well, I was delighted when Roseanne invited me, I think it was like 10 years ago or so, <laughs> to, to uh, be a keynote speaker at the conference because as many of you uh, have uh, heard, I grew up in Columbia, Missouri. I specifically grew up at Stevens College because my father was a professor here. And it's such a strange feeling after all these years to be walking about the campus, which I've done quite a bit, because so many of the names on the buildings are family friends. Uh, for instance, Dudley Hall is Louise Dudley. And Louise Dudley was a, uh, a, a very good friend of my parents. Also a remarkable woman, though, she invented the discipline of the humanities back in the 1920s. And in a way, I owe my entire career to her because I took a humanities course in high school from Conrad Stosky at Hickman High School, who was a disciple of Louise Dudley. And one of our assignments was to do something creative. So I wrote a half hour musical, which I performed with a group of friends, my brother Canton <laughs> and Kingsley Day, uh, The Teeth of Mons Herbert, about a search for a potato salad recipe, uh, featuring the immortal potato recipe song, cooked potatoes, sliced three cups, onions grated, five to six tablespoons. You're very lucky there's no piano here, because I will sit down at a flash and, and play that song. And it really started me off on writing, uh, well, first of all, musicals, but, but anything that, that was in front of an audience. Uh, so Louise Dudley of uh, Samson Halls, Patsy Sampson was the first woman president of uh, Stevens. Leela <coughs> Rainey Wood was the wife of President James Madison Wood. Uh, now, she sadly died at a young age in 1936. Uh, president Wood, though, who became president in 1912 and then reigned for 35 years, was still around in town when my father uh, came to Columbia. And he left quite a legacy to uh, uh, Stevens. He was a, a really renowned educator and put Stevens on the map. He also, though, had this odd belief that college endowment funds were unethical. <laughs> so <laughs> the college had to deal with that. So anyway, I was delighted when I was invited to be a keynote speaker. And then Roseanne said, and the theme is uh, the female gaze in cinema, which gave me pause. I, last night, I, uh, I had a, a, a phone call with Pippa Cleary, who's this incredibly successful composer in the UK. She's the first woman composer to have three shows on the West End in London. She's going to Broadway this, this fall. Uh, she and I are writing a, a movie together. She's writing the songs and also a musical. And ever since I've gotten to Stevens, I've been angling to get Stevens to do a workshop of this musical next year and a production. Uh, so no pressure, but pretty much any time I see someone from the theater department say, about that workshop. So, uh, so, so I, I, she said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm at this conference, uh, uh, and I'm giving a keynote uh, speech, and the, the, the theme is the female gaze in cinema. And she immediately said, they asked you to talk about the female gaze? And <laughs> that was pretty much my attitude also. But I was so happy that, uh, uh, that uh, um, Megan and, uh, Le Le how do you pronounce it? Lorian like DeLorean the car, that Megan Lorian gave this fantastic talk about the female gaze, uh, which I was mesmerized by. Uh, everything rang true to me. Uh, not only, though, did they talk about the female gaze, but they also talked about character and structuring the story, which applies to, to everything sort of a, a story, leaving me very little to talk about. <laughs> But what I thought I would do uh, would be to talk about story in a very specific way based on my experiences at Disney and DreamWorks. Uh, and I'll explain a, a little bit more in a moment. 
And it's so specific that it may not relate directly to projects that you are working on. But I have found that it's, as in a screenplay, being specific is always better than being general. And at the very least, um, it gives you something to bounce off of. Even if there's absolutely nothing that you can use, even if there's nothing that you agree with fundamentally about your belief system, nonetheless, uh, it's my experience in large part and uh, it might be useful in some sort of way. So I was, I happened to be part of the first creative meeting at DreamWorks with Jeffrey Katzenberg when they started up that studio. And oddly enough, I was at the last creative meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg right before he sold the studio to Universal, and it was about the same project. It was about uh, Prince of Egypt. And at that first meeting, Jeffrey said, he had his initial talk with Steven Spielberg. Uh, it was Steven Spielberg, David Geffen, and, and Jeffrey started up the, uh, the, the studio. And Steven said, you know, I've made some animated movies, made American Tale and other movies, but for all my experience, they're not as good as the Disney animated features. Is there a secret? And uh, Jeffrey said, well, actually, there are three secrets. Walt Disney had three secrets, how he chooses a story, which he passed down to the nine wise old men. There were nine animators who were the lead animators at Disney. Uh, and because animators never die, they were still there when, uh, when uh, the Michael Eisner and, and the Jeffrey crew moved in. And they relayed these three secrets. Uh, and the secrets were, and I'll explain them at length, it was uh, universal theme, marquee value, and uh, the relationship of the audience to the story. And I'll go into each three. Uh, the first one is perhaps the most obvious, the universal theme. Walt Disney had no interest in making movies, particularly as animated movies that appealed to a sliver of the audience. Midlife crisis, or uh, uh, how you, you know, uh, uh, react to, you know, the, uh, uh, to a, a, a career crisis. He wanted to speak to every single person in the audience, no matter who they were, uh, what their situation in life was, how old they were. So he tended to look for themes that were universal, which were the love of a mother and child, as in Dumbo, uh, the perils of growing up in your finding way, uh, uh, as in uh, Pinocchio. Uh, so he always tried to find a universal theme that connected directly uh, to the audience. Uh, so that's somewhat uncontroversial. Uh, I will say, by the way, as I looked at my notes, I realized that I skipped over something, <laughs> which is that uh, when I was asked to talk here, First of all, I got the little hiccup when you know, I realized that uh, the theme was the, the female gaze. And then I had the big relief that I don't have to talk about the female gaze because Meg and Lorian talked about it. <laughs> the second one, though, is we're giving you a special slot right before the costume exhibition, which is about how costumes affect uh, screenwriters in creating female characters. Can you say a few words about that? And I thought, OK, what do I know about costume design. And then I realized I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I'm doubly unqualified to give this talk. But I did work with one of the, the great costume designers on Prince of Egypt, uh, on the theater version of Prince of Egypt, which, by the way, was filmed. The, the West End production was filmed, and, and you actually can see it in December the film is released. So. Uh, like, she, she had the same attitude towards her work that all the designers that I've worked with, all the good, great designers are, the lighting designers, the set designers, the cinematographers, uh, the, all the way down the crew, which was that her goal was not to make her costumes as beautiful as possible. 
Many of them were incredibly beautiful, of course. Instead, she wanted each of the costumes to tell a story. And that is so true of anyone usually associated with a movie or a TV show that their intent is always, no matter what their discipline is, is to tell a story with whatever they're doing. Uh, so that's, in a way, what, what uh, I'm, I'm talking about, about the, the, the universal theme, is that the whole point is to connect with an audience. And the way you connect with an audience is to tell a story that means something to somebody. Uh, and the best way to do that is to have uh, a theme that speaks to everyone. When I started at uh, Pocahontas, there were actually three of us uh, who worked as a team from the beginning to, uh, to the end. There was me, uh, there was Carl Binder, and there was Susanna Grant. Susanna Grant, who went on, by the way, to write Aaron Brockovich, uh, a little tie-in with, with, with the morning. And um, when we started, the first two, three weeks were devoted to one thing. Everybody in the, the creative team, which was about 30 people, including heads of story and, 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 and uh, the producers and the directors and, and, and the, the, the story artists and so forth, everybody was sitting around the table trying to hammer out one sentence that delineated what the story was about. And the three of us were new to animation, and we were sort of sitting there, and afterwards we'd be snickering to our and saying, this is the biggest waste of time ever. It's this bureaucratic thing. Uh, uh, why are we doing this? And at the end of the three weeks, we hammered out a sentence. You'd think that I had memorized it word for word, and I don't, but it was something about people from two warring tribes can learn to live together, something like that. They put the sentence up on every bulletin board, every doorway, every room had this sentence. And we moved on and we thought it was sort of silly. But afterwards, years later, I started to realize how smart it actually was. Because when you're working on a big movie, uh, as, as Meg and Lorian know, there's like 500 people working on a movie. And at the beginning, it's 500 people working on 500 different movies. And the goal is to get those 500 people at the end of the process to be working on one movie. And how do you do it? There's only one way to do it. You just talk and talk and talk. And you ask questions and you pose problems and you try to answer them. And one exercise that you can do is to try to figure out what your movie is about. I do a lot of consulting and often I come in uh, to a film. There aren't usually 500 people on these films. There's usually a, three people I talk to, like a, a producer, a, a, a director, the writer. And one of the first things I say if a movie's in trouble is, okay, so what is your movie about? And very often I will get three different answers. And it's the first time that these people realize they're not working on the same movie because they didn't talk about it. So it's, uh, it, was, it turned out to be a very, very useful exercise. Uh, let me see if I'm ready to move on to the second secret. The secret of the second secrets gets sort of more and more arcane. Uh, the second secret is marquee value. And the marquee is the signpost above the movie theater. Uh, it's, and what Walt Disney wanted was, as you walk past a theater, he wanted you to look up at the marquee, see the title of the movie, Snow White, uh, 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 Sleeping Beauty, uh, Pinocchio, and he wanted his audience to know what the movie was. Um, and you might think in big studios that there are exceptions because there are uh, movies that have original stories that are not based on anything. Inside Out is a, is a great example of this. But you'll be aware that, that usually in the lead up for a movie's coming out, that the studio spills the beans about everything. <laughs> By the time the movie comes out, you feel as if you've seen it often. It drives writers crazy. Uh, but the studios know, and Walt Disney knew, 
that he wanted people uh, to feel comfortable with the story. Now, by the way, when I go through these three secrets, I'm not saying they're good <laughs> or bad. Uh, I'm not saying it's something you should do, but I'm saying this is just the way it was uh, for, for Walt Disney, and that uh, even though it was 100 years ago when he came up with these three secrets, you'll see that there's a lot of this that still lingers on in the, uh, in, in, in the system. So he wanted the audience to know the story when they came in. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why so many movies now are sequels, are franchises, are absolutely known to the audience uh, beforehand. But before you look down your nose at it, uh, it's exactly what the ancient Greeks believed when they uh, wrote theater, when they invented theater. Uh, they didn't come up with original stories for the original tragedies. Uh, they didn't do Agatha Christie mysteries where there were twists and turns and the audience didn't know what was gonna happen next. They were retelling legends that their audience knew beat for beat. Uh, and you might wonder, well, why did people pack the theaters to see something that they already knew? Because uh, you'd think that part of the allure of, of entertainment as a rip-roaring yarn where you don't know what's, what's, what, what's, what's happening. It's because they knew that how you tell the story is in a way more important than what happens in the story. Uh, and the pleasure of the movie is in the telling. It's, it's an age-old, it dates back for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, cavemen sitting around a campfire telling each other over and over and over the stories that they already knew, so they could relive them again. It is the origin of the Bible stories. It's the origin of, of the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's the origin of, uh, you know, all the fairy tales. It's the origin of so many stories. And anyone who has children will know that if there's a movie that they love, that they will want to see it over and over and over again to the point where they know every single line. They can chant along with it. And you wonder what they're getting out of it. They're getting out of it what all audiences get out of a great story, which is reliving the experience, going through the experience, and they know what's going to happen. This is why Walt Disney wanted, in general, to tell stories that his audience already knew, because he wanted to to have the audience live an experience rather than uh, uh, be startled in a Hitchcockian uh, uh, sort of way. I will say there are ways to play around with um, the fact that if an audience uh, knows what's happening. For the theater show in particular, Prince of Egypt as an example, uh, we knew that everybody knew it was gonna happen. Uh, that, that, you know, the Bible story, we couldn't mess with it so the burning bush is going to tell Moses what to do. There are going to be the ten, the, the, the ten plagues <clears throat> that Moses is going to let Pharaoh to, to let him go. But what we did was at each of those terms, we subverted the audience's expectations and did something unexpected, but then came back to the story. So for instance, when in the theater show, Moses comes back to court after being in the desert for years, reunites with his brother who's overjoyed with him, the Pharaoh, and says, let my people go. Ramses in the show says, sure, sure, of course. You know, if I can have you back at court, I will let your people go. Uh, and Moses is overjoyed and he runs out to tell the Hebrews they are free now. And the audience is thinking, what the hell is going on? But then the high priest and, and, and his wife come out from the shadows. You can't do this. You're the Pharaoh. You will, you know, undercut what, you know, how ancient Egypt works. And he has to go back on his word. So we come back to the story. So there were, as you can play fast and loose with, uh, with, with, with a story that everybody knows. Now, the third secret of Walt Disney was aspirational values. And as we get through these three secrets, we get to, you know, anger the writers and the creative people more and more <laughs> because they don't seem so artistic, shall we say. Uh, but the, Walt Disney didn't have much truck with anti-heroes. He wanted the audience to leave the theater feeling better about themselves than when they came in. 
Uh, so it's becoming more and more obvious that what I'm talking about are commercial theaters, movies that sell tickets rather than art films. And I always say there are no rules and regulations in movies or TV shows. You can do whatever you want and more power to you. But, you know, this is the, the, the Disney uh, uh, paradigm at the, at the time, and it's still sort of uh, powerful today. So at the end of the movie, you know, good has triumphed over evil, uh, reason has overcome ignorance, love has won, won over hate. You know, Disney heroes, the animated features that, that I work with, the heroes turn out to be morally better than the average person, making each person in the audience say, hey, I'm also morally better <laughs> than the guy next to him. It's very reassuring. It may be false. <laughs> it may not jibe with reality outside the theater. But for these movies, he wanted the audience uh, to feel better about themselves. So we have these uh, uh, three secrets. So when uh, Jeffrey told these three secrets to Steven Spielberg uh, at the meeting, Steven Spielberg, an uh, intelligent guy, immediately got and said, oh, you mean like the Moses story, like the, the Ten Commandments? And Jeffrey said, that's going to be our first movie. So that's how they decided uh, to do it. And that was sort of uh, Jeffrey's uh, modicum, by the way, the way he, he worked. Uh, there was a young, there, there was a, an institution at Disney Animation called The Gong Show, in which anybody worked in, an, in the animation division had two minutes. They could sign up and they had two minutes to pitch a story to Michael Eisner, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and uh, uh, to Roy Disney, Walt Disney's uh, nephew. And there was a young story artist, uh, uh, who, Mike Gabriel, who came up and he had this big cardboard sheet with a, a a drawing that he had made of a young Indian girl sitting in a canoe surrounded by animals. And he said, Pocahontas. And from the back of the room, Jeffrey said, that's going to be our next movie. <laughs> because he was nothing if not decisive. Uh, because it fulfilled all three criteria. Uh, it had a universal theme of love, which we had written on every board years later. Uh, it um, had marquee value. Everybody knew the story more or less of Pocahontas, which is to say most people knew that there was an Indian girl who fell in love with a white man. Her father was going to chop his head off and she threw himself over uh, his body and, and, and said, don't kill him. None of which is probably true, by the way. <laughs> We played very fast and loose with history. I mean, in reality, she was 12 years old when John Smith came in. She was considered a kid ar around campus. There is no, there is no, uh, there's no evidence that this ever happened. John Smith wrote two autobiographies. In the first autobiography, he never mentioned this, which you would think he would because it's a rather dramatic moment. He did in the second autobiography, which makes you wonder whether he made it up uh, uh, wholesale. But nonetheless, nonetheless, it's a story that people felt they knew, which is, by the way, the best kind of story because it means you can play fast and loose. And also, aspirational values up the wazoo because you certainly come out of the theater feeling better about yourself. Uh, particularly in this day and age of warring tribes. It shows a world in which you have two warring tribes, <coughs> tribes and because of the, the, uh, the efforts of Pocahontas, really, that, that, that it does, she is the main character, that she is able to bring the two together and to, uh, and, and, and to, to save the day. By the way, when Avatar came out, it was very amusing that there was this meme that was going around on the internet that had the outline of Pocahontas with <coughs> all of the Pocahontas names scratched out and the Avatar names included, down to the magic talking willow tree, by the way. <laughs> but I, was, I, I felt uh, 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 more honored than, than, than not. So the three secrets of, of, of Walt Disney, I'm gonna pause here uh, hopefully for good, by the way, 
uh, to see if anybody has any questions, and I sure hope you have more questions than this morning, because I much rather you know, answer questions than uh, uh, just rattle on and on and on, which I certainly can do. But does anybody have any questions about anything? I know the students in the audience are great at answering, answering questions. When I talked to the theater departments, they had millions and millions of questions. Does somebody have a question? Okay. Chris, what would be your favorite example of subverting the Disney rules and still having a commercial success? Well, uh, there's a huge example. Uh, Pocahontas. Oh, yes, I will repeat all these questions. What is an example of a Disney movie that subverts everything that I just talked about, but still worked? Uh, we, Pocahontas had the biggest film premiere that I will ever have in my life. Uh, when we started at animation, animation was hanging on by a thread. Uh, it was in danger of being wiped out completely, and Disney was not going to make any more animated movies before. Uh, the Black Cauldron had come out, lost a bundle. They said, this is a dying business. Roy Disney, uh, considered by many people to be Walt Disney's idiot nephew, but that's not fair, uh, said, <clears throat> you can't do that. Uh, Disney is founded on animation and they will always make animated films. So that's why he is a saint at Disney. When they built, and, and at, this was a point where when I came on board, they had exiled animation from the original animation building that Disney built for animators with the lovely northern windows and the, the hallways you know, where everybody could, could commune by the, and, and exiled everybody to Glendale in these warehouses. So it was on the outs. Then it started to come back with uh, uh, The Little Mermaid and, 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 and uh, Beauty and the Beast. Jeffrey Katzenberg, the ultimate micromanager, realized that he could micromanage animation better than a live action movie. Every single frame he could micromanage. So he fell in love with it. He started being there more and more and more and more. <clears throat> and then, the Lion King came out. Now it's funny because we were working at Pocahontas at the time. I went to the premiere of The Lion King. I was walking out of the theater with uh, Mike Gabriel, who was then the director of uh, uh, Pocahontas. And Mike Gabriel turned to me and said, boy, I'm happy I didn't direct The Lion King. <laughs> Nobody had any clue that it was gonna be this huge hit that it was. <clears throat> and then there was this, after the weekend, there was this big uh, get-together at, at uh, animation. Jeffrey came out and said, well, you know, I, 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 I called up sort of apprehensively the, the guy with the numbers from the box office and said, so how did we do? And he said, well, we did four million. I said, well, four million. I guess that's okay. I mean, we can survive. He said, no, no, you idiot. Don't worry about it. We have a gang of people who will go through the scripts and rewrite everything. So you just write the story. So I wrote this story. One of them turned out to be kind of a Star Trek classic, Darmok. And um, but I just made up kind of gibberish to go in the science places. I just made up stuff. And it went through, as all Star Trek episodes uh, uh, went through, enormous amounts of rewriting by the, uh, by, the, by the writing staff there. But what survived almost intact was my scientific gibberish that made it complete to the stage. <laughs> So, but, you know, obviously, uh, to, to really answer your question, there's, there's a difference between writing a, a science fiction franchise with set characters uh, in which the, the difference between a TV series of the time and uh, a movie is that your characters couldn't change that much. Uh, in an episode, the mantra at the time was each episode had to stand alone could be seen in any order. Uh, so as a result, your characters could change a little bit in the course of the, of the episode, but had to go right back to where they were at the beginning. It's a whole new world now, because now most TV series have an arc and a story, and it's almost like a novel, so times have changed. Any other questions? Yes. Jeffrey Katzenberg worked on development because there's a common saying that he was very good in understanding the story, etc. And, well, and second question, yeah. if working in Disney, uh, there was a contribution in some films by Chris Vogler that 
who worked there as a story consultant, etc. And then he developed his manual, etc. But through his experience, he says, in Disney, especially in the Lion King. Okay, the, uh, the question was, how was it working with Jeffrey Katzenberg? And the question about Vogler, whether he had, well, I think he was a little bit after my time, because I had nothing to do with him. But Jeffrey Katzenberg, as I said, the ultimate micromanager, I had a very, uh, a unique experience working with Jeffrey Katzenberg that is probably not duplicated or ever will be duplicated. When DreamWorks <coughs> started in particular, it was very bare bones. There weren't a whole lot of people working for DreamWorks. Uh, I was the writer on Prince of Egypt. Usually there are several writers for, for movies, but I was the one writer. There were no development executives. There were no middlemen. Everything that I wrote went straight to Jeffrey. And the thing about Jeffrey Katzberg was he had, as far as I could tell, no life. Uh, he had a wife and, and two children, actually, were delightful and, and were at the studio from time to time. But I, I remember one time where it was Thanksgiving and he was off on some trip to China. Where I, I said to, to, to Jeffrey, does your wife, you know, does she ever get upset that you're, you're missing Thanksgiving? And he looked at me as if I was speaking a foreign language. <laughs> he just didn't understand what I was talking about. Uh, but the the great thing about Jeffrey, I've alluded to one thing, which is that he made instant decisions, which is a rarity in the film business. Nobody can make a decision in the film business. He made instant decisions and he stuck with them. 50% of the time he was right and 50% of the time he was wrong. Those are pretty good odds. They're better odds than if you waffle back and forth. Uh, for instance, Shrek. Uh, <clears throat> I often use Shrek as an example, and the students have heard me talk about this from yesterday. I use Shrek as an example of storytelling because it's such a simple story. But it was, a, the, and I worked on it for two seconds. Uh, it was the movie that nobody wanted to be on because nobody knew what the movie was. It took two years of sort of floundering about before they figured out the story. They even changed uh, how it was going to be animated. It was going to be motion capture, but then they gave that up. It wasn't working, and they went to CGI. Uh, the lead voice, Chris Farley, died halfway through, and they had to replace him with Mike Myers. Any sane person would have given up on the project, but Jeffrey was obstinate as hell, and he refused to give up on anything. In the case of Shrek, he was right. Other times, he was wrong. Uh, if you called Jeffrey up in the morning, he would return your phone call that same day. It didn't matter whether you were a janitor calling about, we were out of mops in the floor. He called everybody back. If you sent him a page, if you sent him a scene, if you sent him an entire script, you would get notes the next day. When I was working at DreamWorks, it would be Christmas time. I would be Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and I would, and Jeffrey was off on his annual Christmas retreat to Hawaii with Steven Spielberg that he was forced to go on. Uh, and I would get a call from Hawaii on Christmas Day with notes on pages because he was so desperate to keep uh, uh, working. He had opinions about everything. You could talk to him and sometimes think you're changing his mind, but usually you couldn't. <laughs> So he, and also he wasn't the warmest and cuddliest guy in the world. You didn't have small chat with, with, with Jeffrey. He would come in, he would have his, his can of Diet Coke by the side, and he would launch into it uh, immediately. You know, there was no human side to the guy. Uh, and after I worked with him side by side, for like nine years, and at the end of those nine years, I didn't really feel like I knew the guy any better than at the, at the beginning. But that wasn't, uh, there was a, a Chris Kuzer, the head of development, said he had the same feeling, that, that, uh, that he, he, he never really uh, connected with the guy. But having said all of that, I have nothing but really fond memories of him because he was straightforward, he always told you exactly what he thought of everything, which, believe me, is a blessing. It can hurt a little bit at the first, but to know exactly where you stand in Hollywood, because 
as you know, most Hollywood meetings, you come in and they say, you're a genius, it's brilliant, and then they fire you. <laughs> so you, at least with Jeffrey, you knew exactly where you stood. Uh, so nothing but fond memories uh, of the guy. Any other uh, question? Yes, yes? In large part, it was a byproduct. I will say that working uh, man, my wife said before I left for this, you're going to get canceled because she doesn't, she doesn't trust me. But I will, I will say it anyway. Working at Disney, we we're very conscious of the fact that uh, we we're at the center of popular culture and that everybody was gonna see this movie, and it made a difference. So uh, in the same way that when we were working on Prince of Egypt, we had 400 priests and ministers and rabbis vetting the project as it, as it came along, because we wanted to say the definitive version that, that, that wouldn't upset anybody or, 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 or offend them by going you know, unconsciously uh, against what the Bible is trying to say. So, so for each of these movies, we're very, very conscious of our social responsibility and, and how it affected kids in particular, but, but everybody. Um, for Pocahontas, Pocahontas is, a, is an active character. Uh, she uh, uh, drives the action. She uh, uh, has a want that you know, yes, it is a romance, but she doesn't wind up. She gives up the guy for a greater good. Um, so there are many, many things, even though it was written many, many years ago, that still hold up today. But she is pretty voluptuous. <laughs> so, and that was uh, 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 on purpose, because that was, that was the marching order from Jeffrey Katzenberg. But uh, we got a lot of flack for that, saying this is, uh, what sort of message are you, you, you know, giving to, to uh, uh, your children? And I have two daughters, so I'm not immune from my responsibility. And they were growing up when Pocahontas was coming out. So Milan was a conscious decision to go against what Pocahontas had done. She is boyish. Uh, it's not a romance. There is a, a sort of romance, but, but she you know, is, joins the army to protect her father. She disguises herself as a man. And uh, yes, we were conscious that, you know, uh, that we were going, it was sort of the anti-Pocahontas. Pocahontas traded upon her feminine, well, not consciously, but in the same way that you were talking about uh, the male gaze. There was a lot of male gaze going on with Pocahontas. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but Milan, I think, was, was a, a reaction against that. So yeah, we were to a certain extent uh, conscious. As always, we're just trying to tell a good story. Uh, the social consequences of what we do are kind of in the background, but we never totally forgot about them, even though we we're trying to tell a good story. Other questions? Yes, right there. Did you ever, did you and you, your team ever feel like you had a lot of creative freedom or was Disney usually pushing on your team? Well, uh, the mantra we always were told at Disney, the, the, the overarching philosophy was, you're a piece of shit, you're lucky to have this job, and you can get, we can get rid of you any time we want. Uh, I uh, worked I was right next door to the great Irene Mechie. Irene Mechie wrote, you know Irene, uh, uh, th she wrote uh, The Lion King. <laughs> you know, she made a huge amount of money for Disney. But she, like me, had the same deal. We had four-week deals. Our deals were renewed every four weeks to keep you on your toes. And one day I came in and Irene said, i have gone. They, they didn't renew my deal. I said, the writer of Lion King. <laughs> so, so uh, and I said that there were three of us who were hired by Disney. There was me, Carl, and Susanna. 
When we were hired, we were specifically told that I was hired as the comedy writer, because I started off as a sitcom writer. Uh, Carl was hired as the uh, action guy. And Susanna, this is the facts of life in the 1990s, was hired to provide the teen girl romance. Yes, I'm seeing faces there. But when we got together in the room, and by the way, they didn't give us a room. We had a, a, a desk right in the middle of the animators. But after a day of our yelling and screaming at each other, they put us in an office to get rid of them. Uh, we said, this is nonsense. We're writers. We're not going to be. So from that moment, we worked as a team. And if we had any disagreements, we kept them inside the room. Once we came out of the room, we spoke with one voice. And they tried to divide and conquer us over and over and over again, but to no avail. Uh, and I don't think, if I had been alone, that I would have survived as many years as I did in animation. Because animation, for many writers, was grueling. Uh, and most gave it up and fell by the wayside. But I, I did a lot of them. I lasted for a long time. And I think it's because I learned the lay of the land and had the security of having a team that stuck together at the beginning. Uh, I've always said that I really enjoyed my time at Disney and DreamWorks. Uh, I, I always find something to enjoy, even under the hardest of circumstances. It was thrilling. It was like going to animation university. Uh, it's what people don't understand uh, often <clears throat> is that it's not that I wrote my scripts in a little garret and then sent them in by mail to the, the studio and then got notes and then went back to rewriting. I had an office at the studio and I came in every day, nine to five, and I had to go to every meeting. I always say that, in my time at least, it was like a scientific experiment. If Disney could have done their movies without a writer, they would have, but they can't. <laughs> so they're forced to have writers. That's why sort of apprehensive now uh, uh, about AI. And you know, if they can use AI to replace writers, they will. I don't think they can, frankly. Uh, so um, so uh, I found much more creative gratification, though, writing the stage play. Because there I did have creative control. I was one of a team. I always said at Disney, it was more like being at the UN than being a writer. Because I had to take the individual creative notes of 30 different people uh, and coalesce them into something that was coherent and made sense. Uh, there were a lot of creative decisions you had to make, but basically you were taking a lot of orders. For the stage show, I was, I was free. So I found that in a way, um, it's why I love theater uh, so much. But there were also as I said, the wonderful thing about Disney was you felt that everybody was going to see it and that you were at the center of things. So that, you know, was fantastic. Yes? Are you on strike? You know what? I live in Denmark and I work mainly these days in European projects. So, no, I am not on strike. My brothers are on strike. <laughs> my uh, uh, youngest brother is on The Simpsons, my, my middle brother who founded the MFA program, is, is uh, uh, running the program at Long Island University. They're on strike. I am not. <laughs> yes. You were talking about um, the year you had when you were at the premiere of Pocahontas and that it wouldn't end with a marriage. And I was wondering, was there a lot of discussion about it? <laughs> we discussed it a little bit, but we very quickly realized that if we put a happy ending where Pocahontas and John Smith wound up together at the end of this movie, we would be making such a big conscious decision to change history that what was the message we were sending? Uh, and the message we decided really had to be that, the, that it, was, it was about getting to warring tribes to come to peace, that, that people who hate each other can be brought together and live in peace. <laughs> you can argue about that considering the history of you know, Indians in the United States. <laughs> but as I said, you, know, you want the audience to leave feeling better about themselves than, oh my god, we're, we're genocidal maniacs. You know? uh, so we quickly decided that we just couldn't do it. Uh, and in retrospect, 
as I said, two years later when we were sitting at the premiere, we said, oh my God, <laughs> were, we, were we, you know, reckless or not? But it turned out okay. Yes? I was just um, thinking about how you were talking about yourself as a young boy running around Stevens and stuff like that. How did you go from that to working in the industry? curious like what your trajectory was what was your first writing well I said it in a way well first of all I put on sh the, 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 my trajectory my, my, my history how did I get to where I am uh, by accident the way that everybody gets to, to this there was no game plan one accident led to another uh, but my my father was an English professor here but he wrote novels and plays the plays were put on the theater so we grew up thinking that that's what people did, was they wrote. Uh, I wrote shows for the family, puppet shows. It's amazing how many kids do puppet shows. Uh, I, I, I played the violin and the piano, so I wrote songs also. And then, as I said, I put on this show uh, at, uh, at Hickman High School in my humanities class, which I loved. I expanded it, uh, expanded it just for fun when I went to college, and it was a success, so I used the money that I got to found a theater company at college. I put on a big show with an orchestra and, and sets and everything and a theater and then another big show. And at the end of my college career, I said, well, this is an easy and fun way to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> and then I spent the next near year, uh, nine years finding out, no, it's not an easy and fun way to make a living. Uh, but I just, again, I fell into by accident. I think most people do. Another question that people always ask is, how do you get a job in the industry? How do you get an agent? How do you make it? And every single person has a different story. And it's funny, when you ask people, almost always people are, they say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. What you do is you just, you, you keep on working and you keep on putting it out there and you, you don't give up and uh, you're persistent. And sometimes it uh, pays off. Other questions? Yes. such a different realm from doing theater. So when Prince of Egypt got like the green light to be made into a stage show, is that like kind of the dream come true? Really? Yes, it was a dream come true. The question was how did I wind up writing the theater piece when I was a screenwriter? I started off with a theater company in Chicago and we wrote 20 musicals. Uh, over the course of those nine years. Acted, directed, you know, uh, 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 produced, made the sets, everything ourselves. In our first little uh, uh, theater, which was the size of a shoebox, we made lights out of a tin can. I held them up in the back. Uh, so m musicals were my first love. It's funny how life works. I moved to Denmark, and one of the first, because my wife is Danish, a uh, long time ago, and uh, I was approached pretty early on to write the book to a musical about Hans Christian Andersen. They said, who would you like to write the music? I said, well, my first choice is Stephen Schwartz, but I don't know if he'll do it. So I called him up. It was a week before Wicked opened. And uh, I said, well, I'm sure that you're, you're busy and <laughs> do you have other things to do, but I have this musical I'm, I'm, I'm doing in, in, in Denmark, but Hans Christian, I said, I'll do it because he, had, he so hated the process of making a Broadway musical out of, out of Wicked that he thought this would be a, a, a lark. So he came over to Denmark, had a great time. We wrote the show. So when a few years later, DreamWorks approached him and said, we're gonna make a, a, a theatrical musical out of Prince of Egypt, uh, who would you like to write the book? He, and he said to me, well, usually, he said, the last person in the world that you want to do is ask the original screenwriter because it's so different. But he had just done a musical with me. So he said, oh, well, Philip was that right. So I, and, and uh, I was enormously uh, uh, fortunate and happy about it because that was my first love. So to get, but again, if I hadn't moved to Denmark, I don't think it would have happened. So life works funny. How is it working in Europe? Uh, people always think that I'm going to say that it's night and day, that it's completely different. It's exactly the same. <laughs> a movie is a movie. Uh, 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 and what I get a lot is 
oh, films that he's a Broadway hack and we make European films here, what does he know? But the producers want me. <laughs> I, I mean, in general, uh, uh, I have not found any trouble adapting to the European style of movies. There's a big difference between a big studio movie and European movie, because what European movies are, for the most part, are independent films. But if you work on an independent film in the US, it's the same animal as a European film. I said that the difference more is the funding, because there's no public funding for anything related to the arts in the US. Almost all movies in Europe are funded by the national film institutes, and the people making decisions are the film consultants who are trying to keep their country's film culture alive and who base their decisions not on Walt Disney's Three Secrets of Movies, but on what they think would be a good movie. Sometimes I long for people who make their decisions based on will it make me money or not. There's in a way something cleaner and clearer and freer about it. So the decision making is different. But on the other hand, there are movies that would never get made in a million years here that do get made in Europe because the decision making is, 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 is different. Also, what's interesting, when I came over to Denmark 20 years ago, I would say, oh, you know, if, if, if you're good, you could go to Hollywood, you could act in a movie, you could, and I knew I was lying because there was no way that anybody from Europe was gonna wind up in Hollywood. It's a different world now. And, and in a world where a South Korean TV series in Korea, uh, Squid Games, becomes an international hit, anything is possible. We live in a global world now. Everything is changing, so, yes. What's the hardest thing when writing a character? Honestly, when you were talking about characters, about a character wants something, that a character should be active, that a character uh, uh, should be put through hell, I mean, I really can't say it any better than that. Uh, you know, it's interesting because often I find that writers will fall in love with their characters and they'll coddle them. They'll, they don't want them to go through anything too bad because they love them so much. But you gotta slap them around. <laughs> they gotta suffer. Uh, uh, so that's really, you, you also have to kill your babies. The one scene that you love the most, the one scene that was the reason why you're writing the movie, it's a rule of nature somehow, but it, oh, you always wind up having to throw it out. <laughs> it just works that way. You have to, to, to kill your babies. You have to have a certain uh, objectivity. And I always say that, uh, and I said this to the theater students also, that in my estimation, maybe it's different for other people, but I can't sit around waiting for the muses to descend upon me and give me inspiration. Uh, screenwriting is a craft, and I think of it as solving problems. You're faced with some big, big problems at the beginning. What's this story about? Who's in this story? Who's the main character? What does the main character need? What does the main character want? What's the conflict? What's, what's, what are the obstacles? And then, as you go along, there are more and more problems. Every time you answer one question, there are two questions. And you keep answering those questions, uh, and it never stops. So, but, but there's no, you know, easy answer to this. I mean, all of us, we talk and talk and talk about the secrets of screenwriting, but as William Goldman says, nobody knows anything. So <laughs> I'm very, the older I get, and I'm plenty old, the humbler I get, the more I realize that I don't know. So I, you know, I, I, I talk a good game and maybe it helps people, but, but ultimately everybody is on their own. <laughs> yes. What role would I choose in filmmaking if, uh, if I could? Well, of course, now there's not much else I can do. <laughs> uh, but I will say I started off as a musician. Uh, I started off writing music, and that's long in the past. But I love it, and, and uh, when I'm working with terrific composers like Alan Menken, uh, uh, Pippa Cleary in, in the UK, uh, with whom I am writing a musical, which <laughs> maybe we'll get a workshop here. Uh, I, I envy them a lot because music just speaks so directly 
to people uh, that, you know, and I could have gone in that direction, but I have always thought that I would have been a mediocre musician or composer or violinist or pianist. Uh, so I went a, a, a different uh, uh, approach. But yeah, music, I think. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, so I write uh, historical, and I'm just curious, when you write a historical film, how do you know when you've researched enough? And then how do you know where to draw the line on what you can do? OK, the question is, how much should you research, and when do you draw the line? I will tell you a dirty secret. Uh, I don't do a lot of research. <laughs> um, I am interested in history. So when I wrote, for instance, Prince of Egypt, uh, I knew a lot about ancient Egypt already. Uh, but I do what I call directed research, which is when I need something specific in a script, then I look it up. The glories of Google. And uh, it can be endlessly impressive. You can avoid writing a script for years by doing research and just researching endlessly. And frankly, if you're doing that, you're making a documentary. I, I mean, I, I, again, as I said, Pocahontas, not that accurate <laughs> historically. Um, so uh, to a certain extent, I am inspired by the research. I've done a lot of Templar Knight movies uh, for some reason in Europe. Templar Knights are big. Uh, so I will go to the place where the movie is set. I will scout around. Uh, uh, I will find out historical facts that happened in the, uh, in, in, in the area. Uh, often they will inspire me to come up with story points that I never would have thought of if I hadn't done it. Maybe a month. <laughs> Maybe a month. Uh, the, 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 the other great thing about doing a big studio project is they have researchers who do the work for you or rather correct you if you're wrong. But ultimately, I, you know, I, I'm telling a story, not trying to, to be totally historically accurate, as shocking as that may be. Other? Yes, again. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the current Disney trend for making a lot of live action movies after all the animations, <laughs> especially with the movies that you have participated in with like Mulan? Yeah, the, 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 the question is thoughts about the live action uh, remakes of the animated features. Well, obviously, it's just to make money. And, and the funny thing is, I, I am a commercial screenwriter. I do believe in making money. I do believe in selling tickets. Uh, but I will say that, that, that uh, tangentially, this is not quite answering the question, but I'll get back to it. I, I thought the remake of Mulan missed the entire point of the movie, by the way. I will say that. The whole point of Mulan was she was a normal girl who, because of her sense of <clears throat> obligation to her father, to save her father, she joins the army, this reckless act, and then she has to somehow make it as a girl disguised as a boy in an army. And because she's smart, and persistent and, and thinks outside the box, she's able to save the day. In the live action movie, not only did they get rid of all the fun, they got rid of the songs, they got rid of the dragon, they got rid of the cricket, uh, but she is a superhero from the beginning. She has all this chi that she's keeping uh, hidden. She claims it later in the movie. Uh, but there's, there's no character growth, you know. At one point she says, okay, well I guess after hiding my enormous superpowers, I will let it go. Uh, uh, so what, what is the story about? So I, I did not enjoy the live action uh, uh, version of, of, of uh, Milan. But um, I will say tangentially that, that oddly enough, in Europe, often when they're talking about making a movie, uh, first of all, they say, what's the demographics of the movie? And you say, okay, well, it's, it's aimed for ages seven and a half to, you know, ten and three quarters years old. And then they, you know, they say, well, we have to, to, to talk to research groups and focus groups and so forth. And what I always say to them is, when I came to Disney for the first time, I thought I was going to get barraged with focus groups, 
with marketing guys, with, with, with psychiatrists and so forth. Never in the entire time I was at Disney and DreamWorks, and it was a while ago, so maybe it's changed. Did we talk, there was a wall between, first of all, the business side and us. And I have a lot of stories about the incredible length to which the wall existed. Nobody ever talked about the demographics of the movie. Nobody ever talked about focus groups. Uh, everybody, paradoxically, and this is what people don't believe about these movies, was trying to make the best movie that they could. And not even that. They weren't even thinking about the audience. They're saying, well, what would appeal to a 12-year-old kid? I never heard that. It was, what would I like? Because that's the only way you can write something. You can't try to figure out what somebody in the audience who you don't know is going to like. All you can do is make a movie that speaks to you. Uh, it's one reason why you know, Steven Spielberg, for instance, made these fantastic movies that spoke to a general audience, because that's what he likes. <laughs> He genuinely, you know, is thrilled by the same thing that his audience is thrilled. You can't pretend this stuff. You can't, you know, some people think, well, I'm going to speak down to my audience. You know, I'm making a kid's movie, so obviously they're stupid and, and I have to dumb everything down and so forth. First of all, kids usually understand more of the movie than their parents do. Uh, you, it never works to speak down to, to your audience. I've always said that individually, when you're getting a reaction about a script, for instance, that you've written, that individually uh, people can be idiots, they can be s s smart, they can be way off target, but if you get a group of people together in an audience, that audience collectively is a genius. Uh, and th the audience is, is, is always right. Now that is certainly not something that, that art house filmmakers believe, uh, but it's something that I believe which is that the audience is the ultimate judge of whether uh, something works or not. So anyway, I, the, the funny thing is you can make a movie that's designed scientifically to appeal to a certain demographic. I just don't think they're ever very good. And as it turns out, if they're not very good, they tend not to make money. Usually the good films rise up to the top. That's why Hollywood is so afraid of something new. I know this is in a seem sense to con contradict the uh, second secret of Walt Disney, which is you should make a movie that audiences know. But usually it's the original movies, the movies that are outside the box, the movies that people haven't seen before that become the huge hits. And then what happens? You make a million movies based on that movie and you, you set up a franchise and so forth. So, you know, there's, there's no easy solution. Other, other questions? Well, okay, uh, it's been a long day, so I'm sure it'll be good to get out earlier, but thank you very much. <laughs>